batteries are central to the energy transition and the adoption of electric vehicles. And prices have been falling rapidly over the years and continue to fall rapidly. So the Bloomberg New Energy Finance recently released its uh, battery price survey. And I'm going to talk to Dr. James Frith, who's the head of energy storage research and lead author of the report. Welcome to the interview, James. Hey, Malcolm. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, kind of happy to talk about uh, what I would say is probably one of my favorite subjects and, and, and probably something that I... Um, yeah, kind of get to talk about a lot, but can always talk about more. Well, look, I mean, this is a good this is a good news story, but with a note of caution attached to it because prices went down six percent over 2020, but uh, mineral prices uh, are maybe going to uh, maybe even raise prices a little bit uh, coming into the new year. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So. I, I think to, to kind of take a step back, as, as you say, prices fell by 6% in, in 2021 um, compared to 2020. So they fell from $140 per kilowatt hour down to $132 per kilowatt hour. Um, that's obviously kind of good for the industry. Um, but, you know, that's against the backdrop of uh, an original expectation of a 9% fall. So prices didn't fall as much as we had expected. And that's, as you say, because in the second half of the year, there was upward pressure on pricing um, from increasing raw material prices and uh, kind of increasing cost of, of, of components such as the electrolyte. Um, for large automotive um, companies, uh, you know, as you say, it, it's really going to be kind of the beginning of 2022 that those high commodity prices really start to bite just because there is a little bit of a kind of lag between spot price market dynamics um, and that feeding through to the kind of longer term contracts that a lot of um, large companies have with their cell suppliers or raw material suppliers. Now, an interesting point in your uh, in your report is that while $132 a kilowatt hour may be the average, there's a, a big variation in there. The chi uh, China is the lowest cost producer. Uh, I think they got down to around maybe uh, $118 a kilowatt hour, I think it was, uh, or close to that. Uh, but Europe and the United States are 40 and 60% uh, higher. Why is that? Yes, yeah, so, so this is kind of a, a great question. Um, and there's a couple of answers. So, you know, clearly one consideration is that a lot of the cell manufacturing production and raw material production for the battery industry is located in China. So when it comes to things like your logistics, your, your kind of shipping of cells, the costs are lower. There's also the consideration that a lot of companies in, in, in China tend to use lower cost um, chemistries. So lithium ion phosphate, LFP, is one of the most popular kind of chemistries in, in, in China in the stationary storage industry, in the e-bus industry, and in the passenger electric vehicle industry. Um, and, and that, you know, helps to kind of depress prices there. There's also scale within those industries. You know, China has been the leader in electrification for the past kind of, you know, five years, if not the past 10 years. Um, whereas in um, you know, regions like Europe and the US, that demand for passenger electric vehicles is, is, is only really beginning to take off. So in a lot of cases, order volumes tend to be lower and therefore the kind of prices that companies are paying are higher. And so that kind of is one of the other factors that, 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 that influences that differential. But we saw some interesting developments this year. And uh, so, for instance, uh, I think it was GM for its Chevy Bolt and, and Chevy Bolt EV uh, actually announced that it had achieved $100 uh, per kilowatt hour for its battery packs, which is the threshold at which we assume that uh, we'll, we'll have price parity between the electric vehicle and the internal combustion engine equivalent. Uh, is that uh, correct? And is GM the only one that uh, uh, achieved that, uh, that level? So, so, so I think GM uh, has, has kind of announced that it, it has a pathway to get there, but I don't think it's, it's quite there yet. I think in the, the passenger electric vehicle space, there are very few companies that have passed that level, um, uh, you know, and, and certainly kind of um, based on public announcements, it's, it's hard to say, you know, who, who is there or who isn't there. Um, but, you know, we've, we've certainly seen with the introduction of um, new pack designs, in particular, this kind of cell to pack um, technology that, that's come out of China in kind of combination with lithium ion phosphate batteries. We hear about battery packs in the passenger EV space that are now below $100 per kilowatt hour. So you do start to kind of see that 
that price parity entering the market. Now, I think that the, the other thing to just kind of flag on the price parity side of things is, of course, it depends on, you know, the region that you're based, the vehicle segment that you're looking at, and where that kind of price parity point sits. I think in, in 2021, the Department of Energy adjusted what it calls its kind of stretch target for battery pack prices from, you know, $100 per kilowatt hour down to $60 per kilowatt hour. And the reasoning behind that is that, you know, $100 per kilowatt hour allows you to reach price parity with, let's say, kind of mass market electric vehicles. But in order for all passenger electric vehicles to be at parity with their gas equivalent, you need to get down to that 60 mark. So it's, it's, it's a kind of a transitionary phase, but I think it's fair to say that we're in that transitionary phase now and, and we're seeing kind of more and more vehicle segments reaching parity. Uh, in your report, you note that a number of automakers have uh, adopted and announced a path uh, to $80 a kilowatt hour by, by 2030. And I think in previous interviews, you've mentioned that your best guess is that we might even get it down into the low 40s by the early 2030s. Uh, is that still a reasonable guess? Yes, certainly. So, so um, you know, I think just uh, a week ago or so, Ford released its blueprint on how it expects to get pack prices down to $80 per kilowatt hour, um, which is indeed, you know, uh, kind of an impressive feat. Um, particularly as, as, as if you go back kind of two or three years ago, actually many people thought getting below $100 per kilowatt hour was going to be very difficult. Um, based on our top-down analysis, so the, the, the analysis we use as part of our price survey for forecasting prices going forward, we expect that by um, 2030, battery pack prices could be as low as $60 per kilowatt hour on average, and that by 2035, they could be down at about $45 per kilowatt hour. Now, getting to that 2030 number, we see a clear pathway to how that could be achieved. Um, going beyond that to $45 per kilowatt hour, that, that's certainly, um, let's say, kind of more difficult, and, and we're not so clear on the exact pathway to get there yet. Um, but if the historic trends that we've seen over the past decade kind of hold true, that's where we should end up. Uh, one of the things that's become apparent in the last couple of years, James, is the tremendous amount of capital that's being invested in scaling up battery production and the and also resources that are going into engineering uh, these next chemistries, these next you know advanced technologies. Uh, and it seems to me that the uh, the industry has moved uh, be, uh, faster than projections. Uh, is there a chance, you know, throughout the 2020s that we'll see that continue? And in fact, that we might get to, you know, the pathway to 2080, uh, sorry, to $80 a kilowatt hour by 2030. It might be, you know, maybe the late 2070, uh, 2020s or even, even earlier. Yeah, so this is, a, again, kind of, yeah, another great point, point to raise. And I, I think there the, the certainly is, let's say, an upside. Um, you know, we've already seen in the, the passenger electric vehicle market this year that, um, you know, we've increased our, our expectation for, for um, battery demand or for electric vehicle adoption. So back in um, at the beginning of the year when we produced our long term electric vehicle outlook um, versus now, we actually think EV sales will be about 20 percent higher. So we think EV sales will hit about 5.6 million um, vehicles by the end of 2021. So we've already seen that kind of. Um, increase and it's quite possible that we, we could see you know something similar going forward um, just because there's, there's so much momentum behind it there's often you know factors that are hard to predict one of the reasons that EV sales are, are higher than we expected this year is because of the chip shortage which meant that a lot of automakers were prioritizing producing electric vehicles over internal combustion engine vehicles and that's something that uh, you know would have been almost impossible to predict at the beginning of the year so there are factors like that at play that could increase um, demand kind of quicker than we, 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 we expect. There's also adoption of, you know, every time batteries get cheaper, more and more sectors electrify and, and, and start using these batteries. And that then kind of increases demand and has a feedback loop. You know, lower prices leads to more demand, which then leads to kind of, you know, lower prices again as the industry scales um, and finds new ways to, to kind of innovate. Now, um, I, I read another uh, BNEF uh, report recently that noted that energy density in batteries was rising an average of 7% a year. Uh, uh, can we expect that to continue uh, or will we see that either uh, you know, rise quicker or slower given all of the uh, issues we've been talking about this morning? 
yeah, another great question. I, it's hard to say whether it was rise quick or slower. I think you know what what's fair to say is that that over the next decade we think that trend will hold true, uh, particularly as we have um, you know the introduction of new anode materials like um, you know silicon dominant anodes, perhaps even lithium metal anodes, and then you know eventually towards 2030 the adoption of, of kind of solid state um, batteries. You know, then on top of that kind of changes to the the, the, the the pack design as well. We've we've mentioned kind of felt pack being used with lithium ion phosphate. Some similar designs could be used with um, NMC batteries, for example, and again, kind of help to boost the, the energy density there. So I think it's fair to say that we will keep seeing energy densities, um, you know, increase. Um, and that even for chemistries like LFP, you know, we probably have more, more increases coming there as well. So it, it, it is kind of very... Um, exciting at the moment. Well, here's a, a related question, and that is uh, charging times. Uh, because I, I, we have an interesting interplay here where uh, energy density is rising. That means range is going to, going to rise. But at some point, if you can charge the battery quicker, uh, then range becomes less of an issue, assuming that you have access to public charging infrastructure and you can kind of you know, charge up your EV in a reasonable time like you can put gas in a, a, an ICE car. Uh, so what are, where are we at with uh, charging times? Again, uh, yeah, another great question. I mean, so charging times today, you, you, you can get kind of you know, quick charging, which can get you, you know, 80% of your, 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 your charge in under 30 minutes. Um, you know, a lot of companies now are really kind of trying to push that to below 20 with the eventual goal of around, a, you know, a 10 minute charge or just over for around 80% of your, your battery capacity. Um, as you say, that, that could have impact on the, um, you know, the size of the battery pack that's used. What I would kind of, I, I, I suppose, not caution there, but I think there's, there's, there's a playoff that has to be made as well because Although yes, you can fast charge. That does mean that you could use a, a smaller battery pack and and kind of you know still get those you know longer journeys for you know without having to stop you know for too long um, if the charging infrastructure is there. If every time you charge your battery, you're using fast charging, that is going to kind of degrade it, and so you may find that that kind of ends up limiting the life of your vehicle. Um, of course, there are also advances going on there that will kind of limit that 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 degradation process. But I, you know, I think it's it's at, with the technology that we have today, we couldn't just rely on having small battery packs with fast charging because we'll find that actually we've burned through packs, um, you know, so much quicker, and that that in the long run, um, kind of has a negative impact on on on, on the industry and and on the cost to the consumer. Uh, to wrap up this conversation, James, that my my impression in interviewing you on a regular basis and interviewing other battery experts is this is just a tremendous time, a period of innovation, and really the industry is being disrupted, and uh, as and then by you know implication the uh, helping to disrupt the auto industry, uh, is that fair to say? And are we going to con continue to see this kind of innovation, this level of innovation and disruption throughout the 2020s? In my opinion, I, I think we're really just at the beginning. You know, I think there's a huge amount of innovation to come, um, and that really kind of is, is, is kind of personified to me. You know, when we see the, the kind of level of um, money pouring into the industry, and and you know, as you have startups with more money, uh, there's going to be kind of you know more areas that they can look at, more innovations that people can think of. There's the more smart people just looking at the industry as a whole. Yeah, I think we're a long way from kind of plateauing with battery technology. And, I, you know, for me, that is incredibly exciting and, and, and um, kind of means that if there's kind of new innovations that are just coming out of the lab today, they may not see the light today for another kind of 10 or 15 years, which, which tells me there's a long way to go for battery kind of performance and, and improvements. James, always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much for your insights. Perfect. Thanks, Markham.